warning contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. So in this clip, Joe Rogan is going to introduce the idea of intellectual jujitsu and how Jordan Peterson is sort of tapping out all of the other side's top fighters. Thing, but like, <laughs> yeah, I know, but, but we have to yeah. we have to return to some kind of stable sanity that I'm positive that the institutions can't return us to because the the institutional interests uh, really have to do with the fact that certain kinds of growth on which they're predicated, their existence is predicated, have evaporated. So all of these institutions are extremely vulnerable to um, corruption at the moment. And the, the, the real revolution as I'm seeing it is that high agency individuals are out competing traditional institutional structures um, in terms of mind share. And some of those high agency individuals are irresponsible. You know, they're like Milo types that are kind of trying to light things up. And some of them are extremely responsible. And some of them, you know, will do a few irresponsible things, but will self-correct. And this new world that is being born is a huge check on the institutions, but it's still largely separate. Like, am I right that you don't do a lot of network television? I don't do any. Yeah. Anymore, but I used to. I mean, that's how I became famous in the first place. Right. You know? Uh, but yeah, I don't do it anymore. But it's also because there's nothing fun out there like this. Like, there's no place for this. Right. Other than this. This is the only place you could do this. But isn't it interesting to you that we still have not... Like, Jordan had to be dealt with um, by the mainstream because the book was too big. His effect was too large. I think his effect on the internet is bigger than the book. I yeah. think the, the vi YouTube videos and the debates that he has, the one that I was telling you, the recent one, the interview with GQ. So uh, interesting. It's really good. The woman's very smart, but she gets trounced. And it's because he's been in the trenches with this stuff. Uh, in case you're new to my channel, I don't just, this is not a, just a, a clip channel. I do put in my two cents here, and when he says the woman's very smart, uh, she may be very smart. I think she said she was, uh, she's going to be a fellow at Oxford or something. So, uh, but her ideology makes her dumb, and that's one of the things Jordan uh, tries to emphasize, is that if when you start to adopt an ideology, you have to say certain things, and, and Joe is going to uh, say something like this in a few seconds or a minute. Uh, and so Jordan says that he can predict everything she says because she's just an, a puppet to an ideology. And she, of course, tries to trick him because it's not the ideology he thought she believed in. It's a, a variation of it, which was hilarious if you're, if you're watching that interview. Uh, for a long time. I mean, he, he's, he's fighting a very strange fight of dialogue and of interpretation and of discussion and... and the freedom of intellectual sovereignty. You know, there's a lot of people that want you to think a very certain way and use certain words and say certain things. And it doesn't matter whether or not you are in fact racist or sexist or homophobic or whatever. There's a weird battle of control going on. That it now, what I find interesting here is that People on the right are often on Jordan Peterson's side and they see him as their champion as he goes into the battlefield uh, or into the arena, as Joe will later uh, say, and does battle with these people on the left. But then when Jordan says something off script or not in line with the right ideology, uh, people go mental. And you, the prime example of that would be Owen Benjamin re responding to Jordan Peterson's Kavanaugh tweet. Now, I'm someone who falls sort of on the right, but I'm not ideologically on the right. I'm open to ideas and I'm, I, I'm open to consider things without giving over my belief in them. So Owen kind of lost his mind when he saw that tweet from Jordan Peterson. And there's many reasons for that, and I've done multiple videos uh, responding to that. But it's you have to understand, if you're in that position on the right and you lost your mind over Jordan Peterson's Kavanaugh tweet, you have to really take a look in the mirror and say, I am, I am just a puppet of the right ideology, the ideology of the right. 
and I am just a mirror image of those on the left. A heart of it, as much as it is a battle of inclusion and diversity and strengthening our overall progressive mindset, there's a little bit of that too. But there's also an undeniable game that's being played, and people want to win. There's scores that are being scored. There's points on the board. They're throwing in new agents. They have mm. teams going at it. And whenever Jordan goes on one of these conversations, these video interviews, and there's a feminist and Jordan Peterson, like, there's a fucking game going on. We're watching a soccer match. We're watching a wrestling match. This is jujitsu. They're, they're playing intellectual jujitsu. And Jordan's really good at tapping people. He's really good at it. And they're getting pissed. They keep sending in new chicks. <laughs> They said in that Kathy Newman lady, and she's like, so what you're saying is, that didn't work either. She just got devastated. She got rocked. And this is what's happening over and over and over again, because whether you appreciate what he's saying or not, he has some facts that are undeniable. He has some positions that are based on a rich understanding of history and of Marxism right. and of communism and of a lot of the problems with people with compelled thoughts if you're compelling people to behave a certain way compelling people to talk a certain way and we're not talking about you know like compelling people to not commit crimes or violence we're talking about weird things like compelled pronouns okay. and so if i take if i take your analogy because you brought it up um that he's like doing jujitsu yes so in some previous era, and I thought your description of the early days of MMA was fascinating, that we just didn't know what fighting was. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know who would win or what systems worked. And if you think about the mainstream media is like uh, Aikido. It's yes. some system that maybe has some val validity in some very rarefied context. And it comes into general purpose fighting systems and it's, it's dismantled. Yes. very quickly. So now we have this weird situation that we've got this new world of kind of rule laden, anything goes discussions more or less. And the mainstream world doesn't want like the Aikido world doesn't want to acknowledge that this weird UFC type thing is happening. Mm -hmm. How long does that go on for? It goes on for as long as it takes. And this is similar to I think that what's happening intellectually, and this is one of the reasons why I don't think you should stop people from expressing these bad ideas. It's right. one thing for stopping people to say, hey, we need to kill black people. Stopping people to say, we need to kill white people. We need to kill fill in the blank, whatever right. the group is. Yeah, that's, that's different. You're, you're, you're comp clearly stepping outside of the realm of civilization and into war and violence. And we could all collectively decide, and we should all collectively decide. We should have ethics together like whether it's right or left or in the middle we should all decide hey you can't do that because what you're doing is you're you're calling for violence against someone who's not committing any violence can i pause you? i love the fighting analogy or and um what joe is saying here is very true and i love how eric expands on it but what the left is saying is that words are violence and this is where the the trickiness comes in with dealing with them and their position because they may say, Joe, you're completely right, and your words are violence. You just don't know it yet. Right there, because yes. I think there's a really interesting point. Okay. Um, let's assume that we know that that behavior needs to be down-regulated in some way. You, okay. can, you can try to silence the person where we just physically duct tape them so they can't say anything. Right. You know, we, we put them in jail. Uh, we won't, don't give them access to the media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or we can shame them, or we can kind of take them aside. At what layer of this sort of communication stack? It's a very good question. Do we, should, we, because I think one of the things that we haven't done is to positively say, we agree with you that the speech is offensive and it is potentially dangerous, but we think it should be downregulated differently than the deplatforming option. Well, the deplatforming option, the real issue is there's only a few different avenues for these people to express. As much as Eric Weinstein is a super genius he comes across often to me as someone who wants to centrally plan things and I might have just a, a misapprehension of what he's trying to say um, but oftentimes it seems like he want to solve the problem they see that they have the ability to solve the problem and so then they think that all of the problems in society big or small if they can just work it out and they'll come up with a solution 
and it's a sort of a singular solution for everybody to follow, it comes off as very, very much um, socialist or, or communist. Themselves publicly, okay, right. And the the argument that's really strange is: should these be regulated like a utility, or should they be thought of as private businesses get to decide what's on their their channel? Essentially, like it's almost like a a a, a private NBC that everyone can broadcast on. What if it's none of the above? What if the problem is we're trying to pretend? Is it like a dinner party? Is it the public square? Is it a utility? And it's none of these things. I think. These ideas, what I was discussing, that like there's there's a reason why good ideas um, and bad ideas should go to war, is the same reason why even though I kind of knew that most kung fu was bullshit before the UFC, right. I want those guys to get in there and try. Oh, you got some death touch? Hey, come on in. I want to I want to introduce you to a guy. You know, this is uh, his name's Cain Velasquez, and uh, you're gonna try your death touch, and uh, he's just gonna wrestle you to the ground and beat your fucking brains in, okay? Right. But that's not gonna happen because you know death touch. But, Good luck, and you let him duke it out, and that is the battlefield of happening. ideas. But it did, and that's what Jordan Peterson often emphasizes: is that we have these uh, battle of ideas, so that people don't have to die, ideas die. And this has taken mankind a long time to come up with this as a solution to all-out war. It is a little. No, no, no. But, but when you deplatform people, that's when it's not happening. I agree with you. But what I'm trying to get at is that it is a state. And that's a good point that Joe raises is that when Twitter uh, sends you to the gulag, um, they are making sure that the battle of ideas cannot take place. And so what they see as a, as a good that... Uh, hate speech, what they consider hate speech, is not going to be allowed on their platform, and it is their platform, so they have a right to that. And now Eric said, well, you know, what if it's not a common good and so forth? There's debates about that. Often what I see as the battle between liberals and conservatives is that the liberal is shouting about good that they're doing, um, virtue signaling, and in some senses it, it can be good. It's not all bad. And, but it's a short-term good. And the conservatives say, forget about that. You're not seeing the long-term picture. So, yeah, what you might say is good now. It won't be good 10 years from now. It won't be good 50 years from now. And it's, the, it's this long view of history that the conservatives take into account. And they're sort of talking past one another. So the liberal will say, you don't care about people. I'm trying to do good, you're evil. And the conservative says, you don't care about people. I'm trying to save the world from, uh, from the gulags and from, another, from genocides. It's because the conservatives are taking the long view that, as, as Jordan says, you know, they try to nudge you in the direction of total control of, of the totalitarianism. They're not going to push you off the cliff because you can see there's danger. You're, you're going to fall to your death. Instead, they're just going to tap you on the shoulder, and they're going to keep tapping and tapping and tapping until eventually the last tap push, pushes you over, and you're completely unaware that, that it wasn't a violent push that you can defend yourself against. It's these little nudges. I hadn't really thought about it. The extent to which Jordan is the only one of us that they've really gone after like this. Well, he's, first of all... Um, he became famous from this, right? right. This is the, the battle was how he emerged. He emerged from this battle over the use of compelled pronouns for um, various genders, like the Very 28, to Brett 78 situation. different genders. Similar, but not. Okay. Okay. The difference is Brett's position, he comes from a different place. The way they were going at him was so much more unreasonable. They were saying right away that what he has to do is leave work because he's white. They were basically saying a racist thing, and everyone universally acknowledges as racist except for these super lefties who thought that it made sense because in their mind, every white person is somehow or another guilty of at least, at the very least, using your privilege to advance in the world at the uh, in, to the negative impact of people of color and, and, and people of other ethnicities 
So they decided that they are going to have a day of exclusion, and instead of this day of absence having black people and people of color stay home, they were going to kick white people out. So it became right. an aggressive act. Instead of an act of appreciation, it became a, an, a, an act of punishment or an act of exclusion. Right. And by people that are clearly out of their fucking mind. That was also part of the problem. Their, their arguments were incoherent. You would see that fucking stupid president of the university standing in front of those kids and they told him to put his hands down because he was threatening They're, you're you're scaring us you're making violent gestures with your hands so he puts his hands down and they start laughing okay right. this is nonsense now you're in little kids you get little kids run you get lord of the flies on a grand yeah, scale right. in a state university and it's all i mean this is a public so basically what joe is saying is congruent with what i just said is that in brett's case it was too obvious that it was a violent shove off the cliff and people could defend against that. In Jordan's case, the media is highlighting it because it's this simple nudge. It's a gentle tap saying, well, why don't you just use the pronouns? Aren't you transphobic? And so forth. And so they highlight that case and they try to take him down because it's easier for them. What they didn't expect was, as Joe uh, aptly puts it, this this jujitsu master that's tapping all their people out. University, right? Yep. I mean, they get funding, right? Yep. This is all chaos. Nobody agrees. They got baseball bats. They're looking for him if he's coming back to the school. The kids form these vigilante groups with weapons. Over what? Like, who, who's threatening you? Like, what is happening yeah, but here that you need the, weapons? Okay, but the big story there was the non-reporting. What do you mean? Well, the New York Times, Washington Post, all of these major organs, NPR. They didn't report. They didn't that? want to touch the story. Well, this is this is my my big theory here is that every outfit that has a a grand narrative cannot report the news that goes counter narrative. So racism by blacks against whites cannot be reported by any outfit that believes that racism is impossible by blacks against whites. That's such a preposterous position. The idea that racism is exclusive to any group. Well, but the redefinition only, of that the term. I know the redefinition. The redefinition can suck a fat dick. It's a stupid redefinition. Well, that's true. This idea that the only way you can be racist is if you have power over that other group, that's nonsense. Every, mm -hmm. Human beings act as individuals, and they always have power over each other. You have power to intimidate. You have power to isolate. You have power if there's but, more but, but than a few of you. But what's confusing about this is, is that there is no pretense of consistency. I mean, on that right. side of the aisle, it's like we're going to uh, throw out the following 17 completely contradictory rules, and then we'll tell you which rule is operative in any given moment. So, you know, I was going to throw out this concept of the Hilbert problems for social justice. So one of them is um, you cannot understand me because my experience is too different, and you must understand me because right. my is so important. Yeah. Right? Or um, we are all similar enough that any deviation from 50-50 shows you the amount of sexism in a workforce. And we are all so different that once you include women uh, in previously male occupations, you will see a great benefit because of the diversity of opinion. Well, these so there are, are all these self-contradictory couplets. Right, that you and, have to agree to. Well, that's the weird thing is who, assume that I just buy all of your stuff. I think we've made a terrible tactical error. We fought these bad ideas rather than saying, maybe we should just accept all of your bad ideas and then show you what kind of weir weird world. No. Yes. No, yes. no, no, no. You can't do that because they don't make sense. You can't say, oh, yeah, they make sense. Well, well that, then how do I know when you're serious? Well, but that's if my, you just let those through and those things fail. But that's my point is, is that by showing the internal, this is in, in, in mathematics, we call this reductio ad absurdum, that once you take on too many different points, you show the conflicts showing that th those things can't all be true. There's no way in which if I accept all of your ideas, I can run anything. So, you know, take this thing about uh, trans exclusion from Victoria's Secret, right? What? Oh, you didn't hear about this? Oh, God. So the idea is that the Victoria's Secret lingerie division head had to step down um, where there was a scandal in the background that somebody had said, we don't actually want uh, trans people walking the Victoria's Secret runway, right? And so, very interesting. You have a company that is dedicated to the commercial exploitation of humans as sexual objects for the privilege of the male gaze. 
and now you're angry that it doesn't include trans into that exploited class. So they're going to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole, as far as I'm concerned, uh, with Joe um, sort of taking the position that um, Victoria's Secret should allow trans uh, women on their runway because it's not really a show designed for men. So Joe has a, a kind of common sense, it's, it's a kind of a mixed up common sense view of this because he's right that the show may not be primarily for men to watch and the male fantasy and all this kind of thing. But then the fact that, you know, I think Brett Weinstein brings up the point, well, or maybe Joe does that, well, what about the women who go to a Chippendale show? Are they going to want to see a trans man? At the, is that what they're going there, to see a trans man there and so forth? So there's a lot of little um, bits that I think go off topic a little bit here. So I'm going to fast forward it. Is to look at advertising for women, to women. And what phrases get used? So if you use the phrase generation, and I will tell you which principle is operative and which principle is inoperative. That doesn't work. I want you to list your principles and list your mechanisms for resolving the conflicts within your principles. And then once you've done that, we can actually evaluate what you're saying. But at the moment, it requires you as an oracle to tell me which of your many contradic your seemingly contradictory positions is operative in every particular case. So for example, we, we did that one with the person who was the quantum uh, ex-Muslim, trans, trans, you know, yes. everything going on. Which is operative? The person with machilophobia, which is a, a, an extremely rare psychological condition, or the person who appears to be uh, deep into some self, uh, you know, s some radical self-actualization principle. They're even. Uh, the person it, who wears that crazy makeup should be able to wear whatever they want. There's nothing wrong with it. You should be able to dress like Paul Stanley from Kiss if yeah, that's your thing. Uh, assume that that's true. But what if, for example, as a heterosexual male, you don't want to watch um, uh, the crying game at the Victoria's Secret runway show? Do you really do you have, think that – wait a minute. Do you really think – It's interesting. Um, I've sort of dealt with this personally, and one of my Facebook friends uh, came out as a non-binary – trans man he or she went from being p presenting as a white female to now being considered a white male and so and her transness or whatever was seen as a was giving her status in that community but now if she is a white man then he is part of the patriarchy and you're part of the problem so now we have to take care of you just like we do with all the other white men you now are being taken out with the trash so how do you avoid that I think he said that his personal pronouns weren't he and him and all that so he's trying to avoid avoid that somehow but it's so contradictory this is often found in cults you have to believe two contradictory things simultaneously and Brett was rattling them off earlier and he you know there should be a there's probably a list somewhere of all the contradictory positions I go through this all the time on Facebook with some of my friends where they say some something ideological and I say well according to your own ideology the opposite is also true and and they there's never any response their brains just explode I think that Victoria's Secret's runway show is for the heterosexual male in some magic supplies yes. at a store to each other they'll come up with a reason why they make sense no no you don't you don't allow them to put it into the workforce you say look before we put it into the workforce let's just understand the 17 different things that you've said are absolutes well you're basically doing then what jordan does in every single one of these debates you're letting people lay out their idea and then you shoot them down and you decide what's what's logical and what's illogical right i think that's that's the UFC of ideas. Right. And this is why it's important to let these shitty ideas into the match. Okay, why do we still have so much caught up in the Aikido League and the Kung Fu League? It's, because it sounds good. People like the idea that you don't have to learn much. You can just go in there with a death touch and fuck people <laughs> up. They don't want Exactly. I, I love this analogy because it sort of crystallizes 
exactly what I think is going on here, just as Joe said. Everything the left says sounds very good. It appeals to the short-term good often. Um, but then on the conservative side, often looks harsh, mean, mean-spirited, bad. But it's for the long-term good often. Um, and you're going to see this, let's say, with uh, divorce and marriage, right? So a conservative might say, we have to have a lot of barriers to divorce because for the long-term health of the society, high divorce rates are not good for anybody. And But the, the short-term good on the liberal side is, well, the woman is suffering or the man is suffering. You know, they, they try to maybe be uh, not sexist about it. And maybe the children don't want to hear the arguing all the time from the house or whatever. Or maybe a woman is being beaten, so she needs this. So there's sort of like a short-term good, and there's truth in that too, and that's what makes it appealing. Um, but when you take the long view, there has to be a more nuanced view, and this is what Jordan often tries to take, a middle road, a more nuanced view. And he often gets pilloried now by both sides. He used to be the conservative champion, but ever since the Kavanaugh tweet, he's being uh, tarred and feathered by people like Owen Benjamin. I want to think that, oh, you have to practice for 10,000 hours. You have to sprawl and work on your leg kicks and work so on your So maybe this public shaming is death touch. Well, debating. Th these, I think, honestly, and I'm, I'm not trying to blow Jordan's horn any more than I already have, but I think what he does is very yeah. important because he is one of the few that engages in these people in these very public forums, right. in these long-form debates where they go to war with ideas. And these are way better. They they're they're conversations. Good, because he's fucking good at well, it. They want to chop him they're down. They're not picking you so much. Because I'm friendly. I'm not as, as, as like... I'm not as combative as he is. Oh, I see. And I'm also not as smart as he is, and I'm also not as I'm not. I don't have oh, yeah, the credentials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have the credentials that he has. Like when he's the University of Toronto professor, he's right. a PhD. When he's going, except when you bring up psychedelics, uh, Joe Rogan becomes Walter White, Walter Heisenberg White, and he starts naming all the chemical compounds, etc. It's it's kind of amusing to war with these people they're they're throwing out valiant warriors to die at his sword well did you and hear what just happened to with, watch with brett and richard dawkins in no, chicago oh, no what happened they appeared on a stage for the first time oh and did Brett's, they oppose each other oh yeah really on, on religion oh well is dawkins now religious no no no. dawkins is staunchly in that atheist. sort of new atheist right. aggressive I, god I, got, is, I panicked because i know he had a stroke oh okay you know <laughs> guys you know what i'm saying like yeah. got, i thought your brother was an atheist as well yeah but so, Brett doesn't think that uh, that religion is a virus. It's, it's oh, not parasitizing right. humans. Right. He believes that religion is actually an adaptation. And the weird thing was, is he said, look, there's young Dawkins and there's old Dawkins. And young Dawkins came up with these two powerful ideas, the idea that the meme, the unit of ideation, uh, is a, is a gene-like object. He also came up with the idea of the extended phenotype. So when you talked about that, ant mound that you're excavating. That ant mound is in some sense part uh, of the ant strategy. It's such a, uh, it's so deeply tied in that you have to consider the ant mound as part of the ant system because it can't s exist without that complicated underground city. Right. Right. And so what he said was, okay, if I use these two concepts, that memes are like genes and that Genes can throw off a bad meme instantly. So genes, memes have to ride on a gene, and they can't parasitize it too much. And you also have this inclusive fitness, which is that maybe religions co-travel with us and allow us to outcompete those who don't have them because they seem to be found everywhere. They're so prevalent. Right. You have to, if you looked at it objectively, not looked at it in terms of right. you know, how you feel about cult-like behavior right. and people's susceptibility to influence. If you just looked at it objectively, if right. you were from another dimension, you'd go, well, clearly this is a part of being it, a successful person. Tell me about it. Exactly. So Brett, yeah. Brett and Dawkins met, and I think Dawkins had this kind of reaction like, oh, crap. I'm meeting an ultra-Darwinist who's read my work, taken it seriously, and is feeding it back in and saying, you, you Richard Dawkins, in your younger years, established ideas who when the when those ideas logical consequences are explored it completely negates your late life hatred for religion because it reveals it to be an adaptation rather than a parasitization of the human species 
You know, the real problem that I've always had with Dawkins and his take on religion is not that he's wrong or they're right. Or, it's his anger that he has when he's talking to people that believe. Yeah. He, 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 sets, he sets up the kind of like heavy conflict that, you know, the way people interact with each other. Right. Is very the, the reactions are very dependent upon the attitude that a person has when they go into this interaction. You know, two people meet on the street. One person, the one person meets that person, says the same words, and they wind up hugging. Another person meets that person and has a fist fight. Right. Like what? What is? What's the difference? Well, there's a lot of it is the way you approach people. A lot of it is the way you accept people's ideas, the way you communicate with them, the way you allow them to fully express themselves without right. judgment. And he doesn't, he doesn't buy any of that. He feels like there's a war going on, and he's got to shut down religion as quickly as possible. Well, that's the thing. He wanted to... You're, no, so go ahead. No. All right. He, he wanted to fashion uh, science into a cudgel that was maximally efficient for beating the crap out of religion. That's a great way to put it. And... What Brett did is to say, actually, your scientific work goes in the exact opposite direction. The reason I brought it up was it was one of these unexpected occurrences that when you have a meeting of these things, and this is your point about the UFC, is that the mixed martial arts thing is, hey, we don't know what's going to work. We don't mm -hmm. know what's going to happen. No, nobody knows anything yet. And gradually, we came to understand that there were certain systems that were hyper effective and that even those could get... Um, you know, you were making the point earlier about Brazilian jiu-jitsu didn't ad keep advancing uh, at the same level once we understood the role of all of these different systems in advancing fighting. So the question that I'm having repeatedly is what kept Brett and Dawkins, for example, from having that meeting um, where I think Dawkins probably didn't fully understand what he was getting into when he agreed to appear with an evolutionary theorist on stage? Well, do you, don't you think that he's just very confident in his ideas? He's very confident in his intellectual capabilities. He's been doing these type of debates and shutting down these secular pe or these these people that are, I mean, from various religions, right? I mean, from he's he's had these debates with people from Judaism, from Christianity. He's been it's part of his career, right? Yeah, I mean, and even uh, what the fuck's his name, uh, the 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 Indian fella, who uh, everybody makes fun of. What the fuck's his name? Dinesh D'Souza? No, the other guy. The, the one, the, the, the quantum guy that's always using Deepak word. Deepak Chopra. That guy. Yeah. yeah. That guy. That guy is constantly using inappropriate <laughs> quantum words. And right. He throws quantum into fucking vegetable soup and tries to make it to make sense. He, he uses a lot of word salad. Right. You know? And, um, I mean, I've seen him debate him, too. I mean, there's... Well, there's yeah, but, you know, you, you like these videos of the, the fake martial arts guys. Yeah. And they, they, they show up for the challenge because they've actually bought it. Right. Same with Deepak. Well, this is what I'm yeah. tr trying to get at. Isn't it interesting that, in general, the people who say, you know, immigration is a pure good, there is no connection between Islam and terror, um, the only people who oppose pr uh, free trade are protectionists, these people know enough not to want to trounce us because what they're saying is is, is wrong right mm -hmm. and they're expert enough to know that they are they've got a secret five point you know exploding heart technique or something mm -hmm. and they know it's nonsense and so they won't actually I don't think they do well then why don't i don't why, think why they don't do. they want why don't they want in um, I don't think they I don't think they necessarily do actually believe that they're wrong I do think that some of these people that are like super progressive and Very uh, very committed to some of these maybe illogical positions on some of these ideas are Afraid of conflict though, and I think that's one of the reasons why they shy towards progressivism towards socialism I don't think they like conflict they, uh, don't Some they of love them conflict? don't. No, no, no. They like to get together and scream at people. Okay. This is what they like to get, get, get together in large groups okay. and say, we know where you sleep. You fucking racist. You fucking piece of shit. But one-on-one, -on -one, they're cowards. Okay. It, like, this is, this is the type of person that would think it's a good idea to, to show up and bang on someone's well, door you, and you scare think... them in their home. That type of person is not the type of person that, would, that looks forward to, on an even battlefield, engaging someone one-on-one -on -one and just just open communication that's not what they're doing i think joe is absolutely correct here that a lot of the the differences in how people deal with things on the political or religious or philosophical 
realms has to do with their personalities. And this is something that Jordan Peterson is an expert in. And he's one of the leading researchers into this personality stuff. And so, like Jordan will often say, like, so the, the personalities who are boisterous and, and extroverted are the types who are going to go out in the street and march. And they tend to also be liberal. There's some correlation there that uh, Jordan did a, a specific study between personality and political views. I, I don't know the breakdown off the top of my head, but I'm just going to say that it seems like the liberal types are the more extroverted types who will go out and march in the streets. And the conservative types, personality speaking, uh, are more reserved and are not the type of people to go out and march in the street. And so you don't see any of that. They're not very visible. The only time they get visible is when they're motivated to go out and vote. They tend to be the type of people to show up on time at a polling place with all their papers in order or whatever and, and cast their ballot. Doing. What they're doing is trying to silence people, scare people, intimidate people. They're bullies, intellectual bullies. People who are bullies are almost always insecure. They're almost always scared. So this is why there's been very few people that are jumping forward to, to try to go to intellectual war. But would, wouldn't it, Rachel Maddow or uh, Linda Sarsour want in? I mean, they're pretty... Okay. There's, you, you're dealing with two very different types of human beings. So Rachel Maddow is one thing. Linda Sarsour is a very, very seriously religious person who's got some, you know, very deep beliefs as far as Islam. She wears the hijab. Right. She means just as... To, two totally different things. No, no, but, it, but if I listed a group of people, like the late night comedians, there's this very weird thing that they all seem to believe the same. Like there was a secret meeting that they all agreed to a bunch of stuff that I, I, I want to see the conference proceedings. Like what? And this is where you get into Owen Benjamin's theory about what goes on in Hollywood and how you have to, you have to toe the party line. You have to, you know, you have to be very ideological and on the left to work in Hollywood and Joe kind of gets into that a little bit here and they kind of go off track. I think eventually if you, it, it, I would recommend you watch the, the whole uh, podcast. It's very interesting. I'm probably going to clip out some more things, but this video itself is running a little bit long. So I'm going to end it here. Jordan Peterson is the hoist Gracie of, uh, of the intellectual battlefield and he's the UFC into the intellectual UFC champion. And he, he's the one that they have to take down that the left sees him as the champion so of course if you're a fighter you want to aim at the top you want to get the belt you want to win the big prize so you go after the champion that's why primarily they're going after jordan peterson uh so you know what to do beep beep